The pirate's choice for a melee fight was to pick a sword, a weapon which is exclusively used for combat. On some occasion, the sword just wouldn't do. The weapon might need to fulfill some other tactical purpose, like a tool. Maybe it was a tool first and foremost, but it could also be applied in the heat of the moment. The knife is a perfect example. Pretty much every sailor had one, as they were an essential tool for a variety of jobs, such as cutting foul rigging. Knives could also be used in gun maintenance, as an improvised screwdriver for opening a flintlock. They were also used as an eating utensil, and for carving wood or bone into little trinkets. Most sailors were armed with a rigging knife. A surviving example was found in the shipwreck of the Dauphin. It has a rather extravagant handle, with the blade slightly bent away from it. Their point was either flat, clipped, stanted, or half-speared. The smith would often leave his mark on the blade, typically in the form of his name. The trade knives from the wreck of La Belle carried the name Hugussi Perrine. The gullet knife had a single-edged, spear-point blade, and were very often foldable. This omitted the need for a sheath, and made them more compact. You could keep them in a pouch or pocket. A sailor might also make a knife himself. The handle could be carved from wood or bone, and the blade might be made from a broken cutlass, seen in this example. Knives were also a great tool for the hunt. Skinning, cutting meat, cutting bones. The Bukanyi, a type of hunter-pirate hybrids, were often equipped with three or four long knives in a single sheath. The best of these knives were imported from Flanders, that's a region in modern Belgium, not the Simpson character, and they kinda looked like kitchen knives. The knife is a rather poor choice in combat, owing to its length compared to a proper sword. It could be used in the offhand to parry incoming blows, but the pistol was better for this purpose. If you somehow dropped your main weapon, it might have to suffice at very close distance. The knife was not so much a weapon for combat, as it was for mutiny, assassination, and backstabbing. Its advantage here was that it's easy to conceal, and that every sailor was permitted to have them. Many are the incidents of sailors or passengers going at each other with knives for whatever reason. Personal disputes, boredom, drunkenness. Sailors might use them in uprisings, sneak into the officer's quarters, and cut their throats while they sleep. Unlike the knife, which was primarily a tool, the dagger was designed as an actual weapon. During the Middle Ages, it was great for slipping through the gaps between armor plates, whereas in the 17th century, it had primarily developed into a tool for parrying, and was also a status symbol. What made the dagger more suited for combat than the knife was the addition of a longer blade, often specialized for cutting or thrusting, and a guard between the handle and blade, preventing the hand from slipping and cutting itself. Daggers were often a part of the refined fencing style developed during this era, which favored a small sword in the primary hand and a gauche dagger in the offhand. The poignard was a thrusting dagger with a long, tapered blade, traditionally worn by European aristocrats. Spanish sailors, who loved to LARP as men above their actual station, would often wear the symbols of the hidalgos, such as cloaks, rapiers, and a poignard. This eyewitness illustration from around 1684 displays several such items in the possession of a corsario, notably the poignard. Remnants of a pewter dirk was found in the wreck of the Queen Anne's Revenge. First developed as a distinct weapon in the early 1700s, the dirk had a long and straight double-edged blade, a guard of some sort, and a cylindrical handle. In the latter part of the century, it became a badge of office among naval midshipmen. It can be seen on portrayals of the Battle of Trafalgar, for example. The Chris was an Indonesian dagger with a distinctively wavy blade, which was considered sacred and often passed down from father to son. The most valuable were made from nickeliferous iron, a rare material found only in a few places of Malaysia and Indonesia. The principal carriers of this sort were the Bajanese merchant warriors, sometimes encountered by pirates who visited the region. Sometime in the 1680s, Alonso Ramirez, a Puerto Rican carpenter forced into a buccaneer crew, which was also William Dampier's crew by the way, acquired a Chris, possibly of this sort. Chrises were sometimes given as exceptional gifts to European visitors. But it's uncertain how Alonso acquired his. Maybe he stole it, but he spent a rather long time in the region, so maybe it was a gift. He later gave his Chris to Don Melcor Pacheco, an encomendero of New Spain. And though it's uncertain if Alonso served the pirates willingly or not, it attests to them possibly owning such weaponry, should they ever visit the region. The bayonet can be seen as a middle ground, but also a divergence of the knife and dagger. Like the knife, it was often used for utility purposes like cutting and carving, but like the dagger, had a distinct battlefield purpose. Early bayonets, 
plug bayonets had tapered wooden handles, plugs, which you plugged into the muzzle of a musket, effectively turning it into a spear. These weapons were frequently found among naval expeditions and buccaneers. The problem was that after plugging the musket, it was impossible to remove the bayonet without a tool, only plausible outside of combat. So if they started shooting at you again, you were kinda screwed. Instead, the socket bayonet was invented in 1687. The wooden handle had now been removed in favor of an iron bar, with a ring on its end, which was attached to the barrel, turned, and locked on. By 1695, socket bayonets had replaced the plug in the French Navy. These came both in narrow, triangular shapes, and a flat, broader version. It appears as if the English were still using plugs in 1711, as they appear in a dictionary from the same year. But the same dictionary describes drilling for socket bayonets. So maybe the entry was a leftover from old editions, or maybe they were used simultaneously. If you forgot to bring a bayonet, the farm could still be used as a melee weapon. Muskets are still pretty long and you can make thrusting attacks with muscle. A single blow is unlikely to kill someone per se, but enough to severely hurt or knock him out, and several jabs to the face would cause a lot of damage. But it was part of official doctrine to grab the gun by the barrel and use the shoulder butt as a warhammer. Pistols and muskets were both back heavy, since the back held both the firing mechanism and the large wooden butt. Back weight gave better stability. It also made it better as a melee weapon. Pistol handles were often furnished with a rounded handrest, inlaid with metal, making for an excellent mace. Musket butts in the early 1600s had an almost dedicated axe shape, specifically for striking. Though these extreme models grew out of fashion as the century progressed, later muskets retained a similarity, in case you dropped your bayonet. Aside from muskets and bayonets, there were dedicated spears used at sea and its environs. Most recognized would be the boarding pike. Also known as spontoon, half pike, spear or lance, this was a weapon pure and simple. Shorter than infantry pikes, at about 8 to 12 feet, they had flat butts in order to avoid damaging the deck or comrades behind them, unlike infantry pikes which often had sharp iron prods to secure them into the ground during cavalry charges. The head was either pointed like a pike or leaf shaped. The most distinguishing mark of the boarding pike is the lack of distinction. It is completely plain, completely straight, as to avoid it getting caught in any piece of rigging. Decorated pikes were usually specialist weapons wielded by officers, as a symbol of their station. The partisan was such a type, and the French sort bore an anchor in the blade. Tactically, the boarding pike was best used defensively in formations, keeping boarders from climbing aboard your ship, forcing them away from close quarters, hatches, or gun ports. It was a highly effective weapon, as long as the enemy did not get too close. At these distances, the spearman would have to shorten his grip, making it difficult to wield within a tight room. Spears were a favored weapon among Spanish colonial militias, who often used them in conjunction with shields. These were useless against buccaneer firearms, and were primarily issued for fights against indigenous tribes. Spanish cavalry also used lances, and sometimes a type of hooked hunting spear, called a hoxing iron. It is difficult to discuss pirate weaponry without mentioning the iconic boarding axe. Also known as battle axes, pole axes, hatchets, tomahawks, or simply axes. It was more so a tool than a weapon, but a flexible one at that. Both subtle and obvious was its use as a fire axe. Fires were a huge hazard to wooden ships, where the boarding axe was very much used like a modern fire axe. The blade for hacking apart burning wood, the spike for picking loose burning objects, such as heated cannonballs lodged in the hull. Its value as a fire prevention tool alone warranted its presence aboard a ship. Neither should it be underestimated just how thick a rope was. This would be difficult to cut through even with a cutlass, let alone a knife. Axes were used for cutting loose rogue sails and clearing the lines of enemy grappling hooks. If a mast or sail was shot loose during combat, its entanglement in the rigging could severely hinder the ship's already crippled mobility or disturb the crew's ability to fight. Boarding axes were vital in clearing away broken bits of rigging, but if a mass of rope was entangled, it would be near impossible to simply hack it. Instead, the axe was used as a hook to clear out a tangle before severing it. The boarding axe was also used offensively. A maritime dictionary from 1757 suggested that if the attacker engaged a ship higher than theirs, they could drive boarding axes into her side and use them as a scaling ladder. This doesn't appear to have been documented anywhere else, and historians have disputed this idea. 
it's far too easy for the axe to fall out, especially if a bunch of guys would climb on it. The author may have misinterpreted descriptions of where the axe could be used for assistance when climbing, think like an ice pick, but mostly for hooking onto protruding levels of wood, like channels or gunnels, and then pulling the wielder up. Of course, the axe could be used in a fight, hacking bones, cutting off heads, it all sounds very brutal, but it wasn't regarded as an effective weapon. In 1802, Lieutenant Skinner of the Royal Navy called it inferior when opposed to thrusting weapons, such as the musket and bayonet, pike or cutlass. It might have been better defensively, as the thicker shaft and wide blade could easily parry blows. There's one documented instance where the axe head was able to absorb a bullet, saving its wielder from being shot in the hip. He had it holstered while reloading his musket. Indeed, it was rare for a boarder to only be issued an axe. Grenadiers in the army were furnished with a musket, sword and hatchet, and pirates likely had a musket, brace of pistols, cutlass and axe. The guns and sword for fighting, and the axe as an offensive tool. The boarding axe could be used for destroying the enemy's rigging. Since gunpowder was better used for this purpose, axes were better for specialist operations, cutting the shrouds that supported masts, or even the port tackle lanyards, meaning that if the enemy wanted to fire, they couldn't open their gun ports. It was common for ship or defenders to retreat into close quarters. These were fortified sections in the front and back of the ship, creating a killing zone in between. Axes were used to hack apart the barricades and the doors securing them. The spike was used as a crowbar for prying open doors or even chests of plunder. The buccaneers used them for similar purposes when attacking cities on land, hacking apart city gates and such. If the close quarters proved impossible to take, the pirates could get above it, hack a hole in the deck and throw grenades into the hole. If they still had to retreat, the axe was used to destroy as much rigging as possible. The axe could also be used after combat for medicinal purposes. In lack of a saw, it could be used for amputations, but one pirate carpenter allegedly heated his axe until red hot and then used it to cauterize an amputated limb. The shaft of a typical boarding axe was about 28 inches, 71 centimeters, and were held with both hands. But there were also one-handed variants, usually about 15 inches, 38 centimeters. The butt might be furnished with a little round knob or a flat disc. The head, or pole, of the axe was invariably made of iron or steel. It consisted of a wedged axe head merged into a ring and backed off by a spike or hook. The pole was fixed onto the shaft by iron bars called langets, which were nailed or screwed into the wood. The ring might be marked with the date of manufacture and the royal cartouche often printed in the head. The design of the pole varied between nationalities. French boarding axes had curved, D-shaped heads with a distinctive downward hooked spike. English boarding axes had a more straight, jagged shape, a wedge-like head and a sort of rectangular spike with a clipped point. They were sometimes halberd headed, as in furnished with a spearhead. This would have improved their otherwise lacking combat capabilities as it enabled effective thrusting, and Bonnie and Mary Reed were depicted with these weapons. The spearhead might seem like an obvious addition, but it did hinder the axe's primary purpose as a tool. When sheathed, the axe would have been considerably uncomfortable or even dangerous. The spear prevented the head or spike from being chopped at corners and angles and it would have made it harder to swing in the lower compartments, so it's easy to see why they were uncommon. The simplest way of carrying the axe was by sticking it through a frog, a leather hoop attached to your belt. The lower end of the shaft might also be drilled with a hole, through which a lanyard was inserted, allowing the axe to be attached to a belt or wrist. In 1703, Swedish Admiral Erik Sjöblad invented the Enterbilspistol, a combined axe pistol. It consisted of a long, slightly curved shaft, culminating in a pistol forestock, with a flint lock, trigger, and an axe head around the muzzle. The axe head is distinctively taller at the top, allowing for thrusting attacks. These weapons were produced in some quantity until the 19th century and have been discovered as cap lock conversions. They came in both short and long variants from 33 inches to 83 centimeters to a whooping 5.5 feet, 167 centimeters. The bill, also called a bill hook, English bill or black bill, was a heavy sort of work knife. It consisted of a broad, forward curving blade with a clipped point at the spine. Unlike its medieval variant, which was thinner and mounted on a long shaft, the knife lacked a spearhead and had a much shorter handle. 
They were good for general cutting and chopping, and could allegedly cleave open a turtle shell. Apparently they were fairly common aboard English ships of the time, and may have been used by a few pirates as a weapon. Halberds are essentially a combined spear and axe, and were used as an effective melee weapon throughout the Middle Ages. By the Golden Age of Piracy, they had largely been reduced to a symbol of rank. They were carried out in the French army and navy, and examples have been found in the shipwreck of La Belle, but they are absent from French privateer wrecks like the Dauphine. Since privateers were usually more pragmatic and less traditionalist than conventional forces, this indicates that the halberd's time as a weapon at sea was over. Which isn't hard to imagine. Long weapons did you a disservice aboard a ship, and it had plenty of protruding bits to get stuck in rigging. Buccaneers are sometimes seen wielding halberds in contemporary books. This should be taken with a pinch of salt. They were drawn by European artists, who had most likely never seen the buccaneers in action, and based them instead on conventional European forces. Which is also why you see them kitted out in helmets and breastplates, which would have been useless on the pirates battlefield. There is not enough archaeological or written evidence to prove that either armor or halberds were common equipment among pirates of this era. If they fought against cavalry, they typically formed up in circular formations and fired their muskets. Could the halberd have appeared among them? Probably in expeditions headed by commissioned gentlemen, but only in limited numbers, and used as a symbol of rank by the officers. The cane was a common implement seen in the hands of gentlemen, to aid them in their walks across the streets of Europe. Spanish gentlemen preferred a silver-headed sword, and they were very often brought to sea by captains. Sailors favored them in general when they visited land, as they had to grow accustomed to walking on stable footing, and liked the motions of the sea. Being made of hard wood, the cane was often used as a makeshift weapon. Gentlemen would use the cane to punish their servants or slaves, sometimes until it broke. Sea captains, including pirates, for punishing insolent crewmen. Whilst the upper echelons preferred to solder disputes with sword and pistol, the working classes used fists, knives, quarterstaves, or cudgels. They were restricted from owning swords. Many are the depictions of sailors and press gangs depicted with cudgels in street fights. They could range from plain sticks to actual walking canes, to these bulbous, caveman looking implements, no doubt able, to bash someone's brain through their nostrils. The deadliest clubs were likely the ones designed by Native Americans. The Caribbean Indians, ritual cannibals and arguably the first pirates of the Caribbean, used a one meter long club made from hard and heavy wood. The head was flat and the sides carved into divisions, which were painted with many colored designs. They used it with great strength and skill, and one blow could allegedly break an arm or split open your head. Probably good for opening coconuts. A lot of other shipboard implements could be used for clubbing, stabbing, swinging and throwing. If you got creative. The next part of this series on melee weapons will look at the weirdest sort of improvised weaponry used in a pinch at sea. Until then, tell me in the comments which one of these weapons you found the most interesting. Or maybe which one you would have used. As usual, thank you to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Patreon supporters get early access to my videos and can watch them without ads. And if you want to interact with fellow pirate enthusiasts, check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Cheerio!